The scripture reading this morning is found in Luke 9, 23, and 24. But I'm also going to read 25 because it ties it all together. Then he said to them, If anyone who would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for me will save it. For what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Amen. Let's go to the word of God, shall we? I hope you have your Bibles. Open them with me to the book of Luke. Hopefully they're still open from the scripture reading just a moment ago. The book of Luke, chapter 9. We're going to finish in our text today. We're actually going to spend some time in another passage as well where we started this series. But Luke, chapter 9, look with me at verse 23. Luke, chapter 9, verse 23. The Bible says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I want to ask the question this morning as we're talking about following Jesus is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? Would you join me one more time in prayer as we now come to the preaching moment? Father in heaven, we've arrived now to study from your book the words that have life. And so, Father, I would ask that you would speak to us now, that you would silence our minds to the worries and the things of the world and the things, the, the activities and the requirements that uh, require our attention. May we put those on hold for a few moments as we focus in on the words of Jesus. I'd ask that you would make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only Jesus could be seen. He who hung on the cross for us. As we consider the words of Jesus, may he not only be lifted up, but may we be drawn to him, for we ask this in his name. Amen. You undoubtedly know the name of John D. Rockefeller. He lived and died almost a century ago, and yet he is, remains one of the most iconic figures of the 21st century. We still talk about his name, and if you listen to national public radio, they're oftentimes referencing him for the endowments that his foundation gives. In fact, the Rockefellers, John Rockefeller, is renowned for being the wealthiest man of all time. He made his fortune with Standard Oil, and uh, you may recognize in the picture Standard Oil, but you may also recognize the symbol, the emblem. That's actually a what kind of gas station? Chevron, that's right. When Standard Oil was broken up into 34 other entities, one of those that emerged was Chevron. Another one was ExxonMobil, two major powerhouses. But there are still, more than 100 years later, gas stations. In fact, there are 10 of them in the United States that carry the name Standard instead of the word Chevron. This is a reference back to the old Standard Oil Company that John Rockefeller stood up. This picture is actually taken right up in Bellevue, just a few miles from here. A good 45-minute drive if there's no traffic, okay? If there's traffic, it'll take you till tomorrow. At least that's how it feels sometime, right? And so, um, but, but, but what happened is, is Standard, the Standard Oil Company was deemed to be uh, too big by the government and, and was breaking the antitrust laws. And so the United States Supreme Court broke down the Standard Oil Company. Here's why they decided they needed to break it down. In 1904, Standard Oil controlled 91% of all the refined oils here in the United States. In, 2000, in, in 1906, that number had dropped a little bit. Um, but uh, as a result of people complaining, in 1911, the United States Supreme Court got in. 
they broke it up into 34 separate entities of which Chevron and ExxonMobil were just a number of those. And you've actually heard of a lot of the other ones. And what happened is when they broke Standard Oil up into 34 entities, John Rockefeller, who was the primary shareholder of Standard Oil, was given 25% stake in all 34 companies. In other words, the man became instantly wealthier than he had ever been before. In fact, almost overnight, Chevron tripled in value. ExxonMobil tripled in value. And the other 32 entities doubled in value. So that it is estimated that in 1913, John Rockefeller was the wealthiest man of all time. And somebody will say to me, well, Pastor Ben, Bill Gates is the wealthiest man alive today, and he's worth about $86 billion. Isn't he the wealthiest of all time? No, Rockefeller has him beat three to one. If you took the money that he made in 1913 and extrapolated that out 100 years, allowing for inflation, Rockefeller's estimated net worth when he died was $336 billion. That's three times Bill Gates' net worth. It is so much money that he set it up in a trust fund, and his trust foundation is only the 39th largest foundation in in the United States. 39th largest. But they still manage to give out $120 million a year in grants for helping society. Phenomenal foundation. And, And so John Rockefeller was... And, and his whole family, the Rockefeller line, and, 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 and they're, you know, John Rockefeller the sixth, he's my generation, they're still living just on the interest of the endowments that is established from all this big oil. Rockefeller is reported to have been asked by a reporter one time, sir, how much money is enough? You've undoubtedly heard his response. Rockefeller responded and said, just a little bit more question I want to ask you this morning is, how much is enough? And when is enough really enough? According to a study that was done at Princeton University in 2010, they figured out that Americans are the most emotionally stable when they're making $75,000 a year. Princeton figured this out over the course of a number of years of study, studying tens of thousands of people, and the study showed that people who make more than 75000 per year uh, have an emotional well-being that corresponds to their individual accomplishments and temperaments and their life circumstances. In other words, at $75,000, people seem to be satisfied in life. They also noticed that those who made less than $75,000 had a reporting falling level of happiness and that they seemed to also have greater instances of disease, divorce, sickness, and painful events. But what caught my attention as I read this study, and, and I put the link if you want on your study guide, it's there on the bottom of the first side of your page, you can go look and read the whole thing for yourself, it's an it, it, it's not, it's not, um, it, it's a long read. It's not a short read. You, you can look at it there. But what caught my attention was the statement inside of it. And it says this, high incomes, this is their conclusion. High incomes don't bring you happiness, but they do bring you a life that you think is better. In other words, happiness is less dependent on the amount of money you have and very dependent on what you think about it. Somebody should have said amen. Y'all going to make me work today. How much is enough? How you, what money you have in your checking account is not equal to your happiness. What you think about the money you have in your checking account is equal to your happiness. Do you understand the difference? If you think you've got enough, then you are most likely content and therefore happy. 
How much is enough? What is enough success? What is enough good deeds? What is enough creativity? What is enough email tweets and texts? What is enough clothes and shoes? What's enough vacation? What's enough for church? What's enough for life? And then after you consider money, monopolies, and markets, and considering the chase for wealth in the world, we must come to the spiritual conclusion, or the spiritual application. We must draw this all the way out to its total end, and the question that we need to ask in the spiritual sense is not how much is enough. The question we need to ask, is Jesus enough? In part one, we had that define the relationship talk, the DTR talk. Do you remember that? If you don't, go back and get study guide one back out and look it back over. We have to define the relationship. In part one, we had to redefine the relationship. After four parts of this series, what I want to do is I want to go back, come full circle to where we started this series and revisit the same passages that we started in series in in part one and let's redefine the relationship have we grown in our relationship since the last time we talked about this we asked in part one are you a fan of jesus or are you a follower of jesus And we defined what fans are, we defined what followers are, and since then we've read and we've reread the text here in Luke. So today let's read it again. It's right there, hopefully it's open in your Bibles, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If anyone desires to come after me, Jesus says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Is Jesus enough? You'll remember that when a rabbi asked someone to follow them, they left everything behind in that moment. When Jesus came to Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In that moment, Peter, James, and John got up from their fishing boat, they dropped their nets, and they followed Jesus away from their livelihood that very moment. Are you following me? When you follow the rabbi, you leave everything behind in that moment. You see, we've got to define the relationship. Jesus isn't looking for fans. He's looking for followers. He's looking for followers to follow him. He's looking for followers who will leave their jobs to be his disciples. He's looking for followers who will be his apostles. He's looking for followers who will be his preachers. He's looking for followers who will be his teachers, his doctors, his tax attorneys, his physical therapist, his optometrist. Y'all aren't hearing me this morning. God is looking for people that will use their gifts in their fields to talk about Jesus. He's looking for followers who will leave their families. That's a tough one. Listen, I have a friend in another state that I have prayed for for more than 20 years. And I have begged this person to follow Jesus, but they don't. They don't come completely. Oh, they come to church. And they even give a tithe and an offering, and they respect the hours of the Sabbath. But when it comes to being baptized, they say no, because they're afraid of what their family will say. Some brothers and sisters, if you deny Jesus before man, God will deny, Jesus will deny you before his Father. Isn't that the biblical truth? Isn't that what the text says? Jesus says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my heavenly Father. And so this person enjoys fellowship, but has not joined membership because they're afraid of what their family will say. Jesus is looking for followers who are willing to step up no matter what their family members say. Jesus is looking for followers who are willing to die with him. When Jesus says, take up your cross daily, what he's literally saying is, will you come and die with me? Which begs the question, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough of a reason to leave your home, to leave your family, to get up on a journey that might lead 
to death. Is Jesus enough? Is he enough? Is Jesus enough of a reason to die? And forget that for a moment. Forget that Jesus is enough to leave your family. And, 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 and is Jesus enough to reason to leave your job? Just lay, lay that aside for just a moment. I, I was reading a blog this week, and, and, and the writer asked the question, if you knew that the rest of your life would be one of suffering and trial and heartache, would the idea of salvation and living forever with Jesus be enough for you to follow him? Lay the rest of it aside for just a moment and look ahead and say, okay, I know that if I follow Jesus, I get to live forever with him in paradise. I get to eat from the tree of life. I get to walk down the streets of gold with gold dust in my toes. Y'all aren't hearing me. The animals are going to love me. I'm going to swing from a giraffe's neck. I'm going to swim with a dolphin. I mean, how much prettier of a moment can you describe? And, and, and I get to see Jesus face to face. No more hurt, no more sorrow, no more pain. If I knew that was my future, would that be enough? And yet I wonder, is it enough? If you knew that from now on, from this moment forward until the second coming or your death, whichever one came first, that you would suffer bad health, and heart attacks, and strokes, and kidney failure, that twice a week or three times a week you'd go have to get hooked up on the dialysis machi uh, machine. If you knew that that was going to be your future from now until Jesus came or you died, but after that you were going to get to be in paradise, would it be enough? Amen. I praise God for those amens because there's a world out there who blames God for those heart attacks and those kidney failures and having to be on dialysis. There's a world out there that hasn't learned that it's not God's fault that they're sick. It's the devil's fault. There's a world out there that places blame on God when our loved ones die. It's not God's fault that they died. Is Jesus enough? If you knew you were going to be broke and barely able to survive, if you knew you were going to be all alone in this world with no friends or no one to support you, would Jesus be enough? Jesus asked, take up your cross and follow me. Which takes me back to John chapter 6. Take, take your Bibles and turn there with me to John chapter 6 because this is where we went when we had that define the moment relationship, define the relationship moment a, a couple of weeks ago. And here in, in John chapter 6, Jesus is having this define the moment. You'll remember the context. The first part of John chapter 6, Jesus feeds uh, 5,000 men. And you'll notice I say 5,000 men because back in those days, bless their hearts, they only counted the guys. If they would have been smart, they would have counted everybody. So we know that men like women, so for every man there was probably some women there because men brought their wives, and men and women have children, and so there were probably some children there, so let's just be conservative and say that there was 10,000 people there, okay? Because not every man and not every woman is married, and not every man had a spouse there, but there were probably some women there without some spouses, and not all of them had kids. So we really could have a number closer to fifteen or 20,000. Y'all aren't hearing me this morning. But for conservative talk, to make it simple, to make the miracle simple for God, y'all aren't hearing me, that we're going to just say that there were 10,000 people there, not 20. And Jesus is out here teaching the people on the hill, and they started getting hungry, and the disciples said, uh, Jesus, we need to send these people away so they can go find some food. And Jesus said, no, you give them something to eat. And the disciples are like, what is this guy doing? Can we be real for a minute? The disciples aren't all in on Jesus yet. They think they are. But on the night of the crucifixion, we find out that they're not all in because they left. Are you with me? So let's just be real about that conversation. Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. What are you talking about, master? We don't got no food. And here comes Andrew, uh, Lord. I found this little sack lunch over here. This kid, he's got a sack lunch. His mom made him five barley loaves and two fish. What's that for all these people? Do you hear the doubt in the question? 
People like to praise the fact that Andrew came to Jesus with the bread. I do too. Because if you've got a problem, there's no better answer than Jesus. Help me. All right? So he brings the only thing he can find, a couple of pieces of barley loaves and a couple of small fish that maybe he caught that morning. When he says small fish, I don't know if he's talking about small perch or small salmon or if they were goldfish. All I know is that they were little. Are you with me? Jesus says, make everybody sit down. And so they all sit down. And Jesus stopped because Jesus has a problem himself. And Jesus teaches us that the solution to our problems is to go to God in prayer. You say, but Jesus was God. Yes, but he teaches us to go to the Father. And Jesus takes that small little pieces of bread, and he takes those two fish, and I just imagine, lean on the idea of inspiration here, that Jesus lifts those up to God and says, God, Father, I want you to bless these things, because we're going to show these people who you are. And then he starts breaking it off. He says, okay, guys, start handing it out. And he starts breaking it off, and, and pretty soon there's a basket here, and Peter's looking at it going, And Jesus is still over there, like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and so Peter takes his basket, and he, he can't take his eyes off Jesus, and he's tripping over people to go feed him, but he can't get over the fact that while he's passing the basket with some bread in it, here's Andrew and James and Bartholomew and, and all the other boys, and they've got baskets too, and they're passing it. Now, you've got to read the story and don't run past it. The Bible tells us that Jesus fed that entire crowd. In other words, Jesus took five loaves and two fish and turned it into a buffet for thousands. No, don't run past the text. Because the text says that when they got done eating, there was leftovers. You come to the Orion house, there's never leftovers. My boy has hollow legs, and I got a big belly. And between the two of us, we can put it away. We graduated from one can of Linkettes a long time ago. We buy them in bulk. You know what I'm saying? We, and, and when there's mashed potatoes, we, we cook, you know, 20-pound sacks at a time to get enough mashed potatoes in that boy's tummy. They're, they're, you come to the Orient house, don't worry, we'll feed you, but there won't be leftovers. <laughs> and, 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 and so what does a leftover mean? You, usually leftovers means one of two things. A, the food wasn't very good, which is not usually the problem. Or B, you had more than enough. And in this story, the Bible tells us, the text tells us, read it carefully there in John chapter 6. The Bible says that there wasn't just leftovers, there was 12 baskets of leftovers. Why does the Bible tell me that there were 12 baskets of leftovers? The number 12 is a number of perfection and completion in the scriptures. In other words, there was enough food that everybody had their fill, could have had more if they had so desired. That there is always more than enough when you come to Jesus. Oh, y'all didn't just hear me. When you come to Jesus, you're always going to have your fill, and there's always going to be something left over for more for later. That's what the text says. And so the Bible tells us that all these people, they, 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 they see Jesus and they say, wow, did you see what he did with that boy's sack lunch? If he was king, he could feed us and we, we wouldn't have to fool with these Romans no more. And Jesus dismissed the crowd and they left and they crossed over to Capernaum. And the Bible tells us, the story continues right there in John 6, that the next day the crowds are looking for Jesus. They skipped breakfast, y'all, because they're looking for where Jesus is. Y'all don't believe me. The Bible says that when they came looking for Jesus, part of it is because they want another miracle. They want another sign. They got fed yesterday. What's he going to do for me today? And if you look ahead at verse 26, John chapter 6, look ahead at verse 26. 
And Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You're hungry. You should have stayed home and had some hash browns and scrambled eggs. Y'all should have had some saucets or some stripples. Y'all aren't hearing me this morning. Stripples. What are stripples? Cardboard pieces of soy meat. Y'all should have stayed home and had yourself some Cheerios, got yourself some energy before you came looking for me. But now you're here, you think I'm going to give you some free food. Let me give you what you really need, and it's not the bread of earth, it's the bread of heaven. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. And now we're here at this moment of definition. Jesus is calling them out, bam, he says, no, you guys are fans, you're not followers. You guys are the guys that when it's tight in the fourth quarter, down by three, you get up and leave the stadium because you think it's all over. You guys are fans. You turn off the television when your team is down at halftime with no hope of coming back. You guys are fans. You don't care about the outcome if it's not the way you thought it should be. Jesus is talking to them. He says, look, let's define the moment. Either you're a fan or you're a follower. Look how they respond, verse 28. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we uh, may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in me who sent you. Verse 30. Then they said to him, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe? Are you for crying out loud real? They just ate yesterday. They just ate a meal that was barely enough for one kid. And look, I don't know why that boy was out there alone without his mama, which tells me he's probably a teenager because I will let my son go do things I would never let my daughter go do. Are you following me? So five loaves and two small fish, that's not very much meal for one growing boy. Y'all aren't with me yet. That's not enough food for one. Jesus turned it into more than enough for tens of thousands. Are you with me now? Have you forgotten, Jesus, what I did yesterday? Were you there on the hillside when we had a banquet? We want a sign, Jesus. That was yesterday. Remember, we didn't need our Cheerios this morning. We haven't had our special K yet. We, we need something. And I just see Jesus wanting to yell at them, did you not eat at my buffet yesterday? What do you mean? And Jesus has a, instead he has a, he has a define the moment, a define the relationship moment here. And, and he, he's calling these fans out for being fickle. And Jesus gives them something to chew on. Look at verse 35. And Jesus said to them, you're looking for bread? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never be hungry. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you still don't believe. You've seen me, and you still don't believe. You saw me yesterday feed you. Here you are today looking for food. You want food? I am the bread of life. I am more than enough for your hungering, starving souls. Which brings me to point number one of this message. When there's only one item on the menu, you find out how hungry you really are. I get home late most nights when we're doing these meetings. You know, I have, and don't, I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. It's a 30 minute drive home if there's no traffic. So by the time everything is done and everything's closed up, all the lights are turned off, all the doors are locked, by the time I get out of here, last night I left here, I left before Tim did, but it was probably 9, 9.15 by the time I got out the door. So I got home at 9.45. I hadn't eaten anything since lunch. I was hungry, y'all. It's not time to be eaten at 9.45, but at 9.45 last night I was putting a craving on some food. And so I walked in the house and I took my shoes off and I walked to the refrigerator and I opened it up and I'm looking in there. Nothing. Close the refrigerator. Walk over here to the pantry and I open it up and I'm looking in the pantry and I start at the top and I'm working my way down and 
pretty soon I'm looking down like this, and pretty soon I'm at the bottom, and I'm not seeing nothing that I want to eat. So what do I do? I close the pantry, but I'm hungry. Y'all aren't hearing me. And so I turn around, and I went to find some food, and where did I go? But I went to the refrigerator as if something miraculously will have appeared that I can eat. <laughs> I open it up, and I'm looking. And there's nothing in there I want to eat. And really, you find out how hungry you really are when there's nothing on the menu that you want to eat. I went to bed last night. I didn't eat. You know why? Couldn't find nothing I wanted. And I decided my hunger was not more important than my desire to find something to eat. Y'all aren't hearing me this morning. When, when, When Jesus is the only thing on the menu... You find out just how strong your connection to Jesus really is. When Jesus is the only thing on the menu, you find out in your relationship if, in fact, he is enough for you. How hungry you are depends on what's on the menu. Because sometimes we think we're hungry and we're really not, we're just bored. And sometimes we think we're hungry and we're just thirsty. Let me tell you about some people I've known over the years who found out if Jesus was enough. Uh, I was in, I, I, I'm going to change their names and I'm going to change the state. A pastor friend of mine told me one time, what matters is the point of the story, not the details of the story, okay? And so just in case they happen to watch, I don't want them to be embarrassed or feel like I'm singling them out. Or maybe you might know them and there's details that you don't, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just going to change the names in the state. So they lived in a long, long, far away place (laughs) on the moon. (laughs) Ron and Amy came to church one Sabbath. I happened to be preaching very um, early in the church service and I saw them come in and I was preaching. They sat down there on the back pew. And uh, they said, I'd never seen them before. I'd never seen them at this, at this church before. And they came in, and, and uh, after church, they came over to me, and they said, Pastor, uh, we need to talk to you. Things are serious at our house. Can you, come to our, can you come to our house, and can you visit with us? Well, I said, sure. And so after church, I don't know why my, my wife was not with me that first visit. Now, she went with me on a lot of these types of visits at that stage in our ministry, and, and, uh, but she wasn't with me. I was all by myself, and so I went over to their house that afternoon, and I sat down to get acquainted with them, and they told me their story. Uh, they had both been raised in the church. They had been both raised to know and love Jesus. They had gone to Sabbath school. They had sung Jesus Loves Me, and they had carried home their little, my little friend, Sabbath school. You know, they knew stuff from when they were, and when they got old enough to make decisions for themselves, they decided to make different decisions, and they left their faith behind. And they chose a lifestyle that, that included um, <clears throat> things that draw you away from God, okay? They, they chose alcohol. They chose tobacco. They chose um, to eat a diet that was not in keeping with the biblical diet. Are you following me? And, and they chose to do things that carried them away from God. They chose parties over church. And everything was going well, and he had this really great paying job. Ron had this really great paying job, and, and Amy had this job. They were making more than enough to be comfortable in life. In fact, by their, by their late 30s, they were debt-free, and their house was paid off. They were doing well for themselves. Are you following me? And, and then all of a sudden, one day, Ron comes home at noon for lunch, and, and lunch is over, and Amy says, are you going back to work? And he says, no, um, I, I was just let go panic moment well they do the math and they figure out that they can live off of amy's income and if they wanted to do extra they could dip into their to their savings account and it would be okay while he looked for a job and so he began to look for a job month number one month number two month number three he can't find a job and month number four amy came home and she says i got bad news i just got a pay cut they've cut my wages in half Now they can't live off of her wages alone. Now they will have to monthly dip into the savings account. And they began to get nervous. And and, and while they're trying to figure all this out, and there are absolutely nothing in the job market for Ron. I mean, he can't find anything for four months now. And this is not in 2008, okay? In 2008, you couldn't find a job. This is when jobs were roaring. You could get work no matter what. He couldn't get a job. And that's when... 
Amy said, I wonder if God's trying to get a hold of our hearts. And he said, I don't know. She says, I, I, I'm getting concerned, and maybe the only solution here is we take this to God. And, and, and Ron wasn't convinced. You know, us guys, we're a little slow sometimes at, at, at coming along on these ideas. We're going to fix this. We're the guys. We're gonna, I'll get a job, and everything will be fine. But, but a month later, he hadn't gotten a job. And Amy says, let's go to church. And that was the Sabbath that they walked into the church where I was preaching on God's grace and God's abundance and God's provision. And they're sitting there going, man, we don't feel grace, we don't feel abundance, and we don't feel provision. And so I sit in their home and I'm listening to them tell their story. And I said, guys, I think God's trying to tell you it's time to get right with him. And I didn't ask them if Jesus was enough. I just asked them to trust Jesus, which now that I think about it is really the same thing, isn't it? Trust him. And you know what they did? They were so ready to trust Jesus that they went into where their, I could see their wine cabinet. It was filled with wine. I'm not talking about cheap $9 wines, y'all. I'm talking about wine. And I don't know wine because I don't drink wine. I don't use it. But I have walked down the wine aisle at, at the Fred Meyer once or twice because it was a shortcut. And I've seen some of the prices there. And I choke and I think, who would spend that much for a little bottle of stuff that doesn't even taste good? But that's just my opinion. They went and got all those bottles of wine. Hundreds of dollars worth of wine. And they poured it down the drain. Right then. Right then. Went and got the tobacco, handed it to me like, what am I going to do with it? I guess I'll throw it away for you. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit pressed in on me, y'all, and told me to talk. And I didn't like what the Holy Spirit said because there is nothing more personal than what the Holy Spirit wanted me to say to them. He said, um, tell them that they need to get right with Jesus in their tithes and offerings. <laughs> yeah, God, they just gave up their alcohol. Can we do that next week? And I'm telling you, I couldn't even sit there. I've never felt it so heavy. And so I said, guys, y'all need to do one more thing. Y'all need to go get your checkbook, and you need to write a check to the, to the church and make it out for tithe and then put some in for offering. They looked at me like I was completely off my rocker. We just gave up our wine, pastor. That was hard enough. I had some crab cakes in the refrigerator. I'm giving those up. And now you want, Pastor, we didn't have enough money without dipping into our savings last month to even make it this month, and you want me to do what? I said, I want you to give an honest tithe on what you took in this month, and I want you to give an offering on it as well. And so she did it. She wrote out a check right there, asked me how to make it out. I told her, and she filled in the the math and she handed it to me I put it in my pocket and I took it straight over to the treasurer's house when I finished at their house so it could get deposited that was on Sabbath on Monday he got a phone call Ron got a job position for you would you come in and talk to us not just a job but a job that paid more than the job he had lost with better benefits and more time off Y'all aren't hearing me. On Monday, Ron got a job offer. On Monday, Amy, out of the blue, got a phone call from a competing company that said, do you have a non-compete? She said, no. They said, we'd like for you to come over and work for us, and here's what we're willing to offer you. And they offered her double the pay with better bennies as well. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. They hadn't missed church since. If they miss church, it's because they were having church in nature or with the pathfinders, which they got involved with, or, they were, you, or maybe they were sick, but you better not mess with their Jesus. Because for them, they realized that Jesus was enough. My very first district, I can tell you this one because they both passed away. My very first district was 20 years ago, and this elderly gentleman called me, he and his wife had been married for years and years and years, but she was sick and she's on her deathbed. 
and, and she had wandered away from Jesus, but, but in her youth she had been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And she told her husband, she said, I'm dying and, and, and it's late for me, but I need to get right with the Lord. You call me an Adventist preacher. And he said, what? Why not the Baptist preacher? She says, you call me an Adventist preacher. Yes, ma'am. This is in Arkansas. You, you, you talk nicely to each other. Yes, ma'am, he said. And so he called me up, and he, said, and he found me out of, there's several others in the area, but he, he called me up. I'm a young preacher, y'all. I, I don't know if I'd been in ministry yet for six months. I was very young, very green. And, and he called me up, and he says, my wife is dying. She wants an Adventist preacher to come pray over her. I'm like, we don't do last rites in the Adventist church. But I said, okay. So I drive down there, and I and I come to his house, and he meets me at the door with a cigar in his hand and a Bud Light in his other hand, and he says, yeah, she's back there. Okay, so I go back there, and I sit down beside her bed, and I take her hand, and I introduce myself to her, and she tells me her story. Her story was that she had grown up knowing Jesus, but when she had met this man, she fell in love with him and loved his lifestyle and loved being free and able to do whatever she wanted to do. And so she followed him. And she turned her back on church and religion and anything having to do with God. She didn't open her Bible at all in all of her life until that moment. Now she's right there and she asked me, she says, can you read to me? Um, yeah, I, I can read to you. I carried at that time, I didn't, you know, we didn't have cell phones back in those days. So I, I carried a little pocket Bible. You know, It had Psalms and Proverbs in the New Testament. And I'm like, brand new preacher, what do I read to her? What do I read to her? I don't know what to read to her. John 3, 16 will do. So I opened up the Bible and I started reading from John chapter 1. And I just read John 1, 2, and 3. And, uh, and when I finished 3, by the time I finished 3, her husband had been listening in the other room. He, he put out the cigar and he came in and he sat down on the other side of the bed. He's got tears in his eyes. And I prayed for her. And I prayed that the Lord would forgive her of her sins. And I told her, you need to pray that God will forgive you of your sins. And I told him, I said, you need to pray and ask God to forgive you of your sins. Well, I left their home, and she died. Not even a week later, she died. And I went to do the funeral, and as I'm doing the funeral, I'm preaching an Adventist message to hippies and guys who look rough because they ride bikes, you know. I'm not trying to be stereotyping. I'm just saying that they, they were rough-looking bunch of people. I, they, they could have taken me out without even thinking about it, you know. I mean, they just, that's, that was her crowd. And they're all standing around, and here I am, and I'm reading from, from the Bible to a bunch of non-believers. And I look up as I finish the prayer and as they're lowering the casket and, and, and the husband wanted to throw dirt on the casket, he's weeping. He is weeping. And he says to me, is she going to be in heaven? I said, I don't know, but what I do know is she confessed her sins and Jesus says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My guess is God's grace is good enough, she'll be there. He said, I gotta be there too. I went to his house the next week and started a Bible study with him. And he died a couple of weeks later in a tragic accident. I imagine I'll see him there too because he had decided as life was on the edge that suddenly he didn't have enough but that Jesus would make it enough. You see, brothers and sisters, I don't know where you're at in your life but you have to decide, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? enough and there's so many stories I could tell you I could talk about cancer and I could talk about divorce and I could talk about addiction and abuse and death I can talk about the morning on Thanksgiving morning when at three o'clock in the morning I got the phone call and I go to the hospital and there's a mother delivered her little baby at 24 weeks and I can tell you that I stood there on Thanksgiving morning holding that little tiny baby in the palm of my hands and I'm trying to tell her that Jesus is enough. And people have to decide, will he be enough in that moment? Because suddenly, religion wasn't enough. 
Because suddenly going to church wasn't enough. Suddenly the spectacle of miracles wasn't enough. And in those moments and in those times when Jesus is the only thing left on the menu, they find out that he is exactly what they need. Because Jesus is more than a rabbi wearing a rabbi's sash. He is the only hope that we people have. And so here in John 6, this DTR moment, some are going to be fans and some are going to be followers. What'd they do? Look at verse 66. Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They looked in the refrigerator and they didn't find what they were looking for. They looked in the pantry and they didn't see what they were looking for. They walked with him. And in the long run, that's what's going to happen. The Bible tells us that there are going to be those who will fade away. Whether we like it or not, there's always going to be somebody somewhere who does not accept the invitation of Jesus. They like the idea of heaven. They like the miracles, especially when they need one. Uh, They like the bread. They like the show. They like the pomp and circumstance and all the paparazzi that falls them. But in the end, it wasn't what they wanted on their menu, and so they leave. They leave. And so look at verse 67. Jesus turns to his 12 and he says, Do you also want to go away? Do you also want to stop following? I don't know how he asked it, but I guess he asked it with a heavy heart. And I I love Peter's response. It's in verse 68. Look at it in your Bible. I'm going to put it on the screen. But Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter really sums it up, doesn't he? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? And that one question is like a thousand questions. Lord, who can teach us like you can teach us? Uh, Lord, who's going to lead us like you do? Uh, Who can compare to you, Jesus? Where are we going to find someone else? Because you see, church, fans bail when the teachings are difficult. Fans bail when they realize it's going to cost them something. Fans bail when they're going to realize that they're going to die. Where do they go? Where do you turn to when life is tough? Fans turn to alcohol. Fans turn to drugs. Fans turn to affairs and meaningless relationships. Fans turn and look for answers in other places. But followers, disciples, stick with Jesus no matter what. Even when following Jesus includes a cross. Even when following Jesus means possibly dying. I'm almost done. But during the First World War, Oswald Chambers was walking past a woman's house. He was with his wife, Biddy. And the woman was at this house was very sick, and, and Biddy turned to Oswald, and she says, I wonder what God's going to do for her. And I, I love his answer. He said, um, in essence, he said that he was more concerned with who God is versus what God would choose to do. Which leads me to point number two. When you really know Jesus, you don't want to leave him. Because you can't wait to see what he's going to do next. When you really love Jesus, when you really know Jesus, Chambers replied that he was more interested in who God is than what God would do. And that's not the words of an indifferent man to a woman's situation. He merely is speaking of his total reliance on the character of God. Though concerned for the woman and her condition, he is more concerned with who Jesus is than what you think he should do. Let that sink in for a moment. Let me ask it a different way. In fact, I'll put it on the screen as well. Because another way of looking at this is, is the character of the creator enough for me to rest no matter what happens next? Jesus doesn't promise that when I start following him, life is going to be like a box of chocolates. It's not going to be all fun and games. 
It's going to be tough. There's going to be trials. There's going to be temptations. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be people that are angry with you. There's going to be daggers and, and spears and guns and bullets. And you might find yourself in a spot in the middle of crossfire, even though you're an innocent bystander like so many found themselves last Sunday evening. Are you hearing me, church? Just because you're a follower of Jesus doesn't make you immune to pain or immune to death. Jesus himself was not immune to death. But he gave himself up freely and he asked for you to do the same. So the question is, is the character of the creator, is the character of Christ good enough for you no matter what happens next? Is Jesus enough? I think Chambers was right. I think that on the one hand, following Jesus is doing what Jesus did, but following Jesus is trusting that Jesus is who he says he is. In fact, I can only think of one reason for following Jesus, and that is to trust him for who he is, because when you trust him, when you're with him, life takes on different meaning. Cool things that are unexplainable happen. You get cool stories to tell your friends. Y'all aren't hearing me. Why else would Peter jump out of a boat in the middle of the lake? Why else would Jairus come to Jesus for healing of his sick daughter who actually died while he was looking for Jesus? Why would Mary and Martha send for Jesus when Lazarus is sick? Why would four guys tear up a roof to drop their buddy in on Jesus for healing if there wasn't something spectacular about the Messiah? Jesus is who he says he is. Following Jesus is about trusting that he is who he says he is. And that brings us to the real question for today. Is Jesus enough for you? If I get cancer... Is Jesus enough? If I lose my job, is Jesus enough? If I can't pay the rent, is Jesus enough? If my spouse leaves me, is, it, is Jesus enough? If my friends turn me in, is Jesus still enough? No matter what, is Jesus enough? Because our love of God should not be about what we think God should be doing for us. Because God's already done it. We need to stop our conditions for following Jesus. We need to stop with the idea that we'll follow him when it suits us. And as I close this series... I want to leave you with two final thoughts. Thought number one is in the story of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. You remember the story there. There was a golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and he had commanded everyone to worship it, and, 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 and three boys didn't bow down. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, look, guys, I really like you. I want to give you another chance. But if you're not willing to go get in that furnace, I'm going to burn you up in the furnace. Uh, if you don't bow down, I'm going to burn you up in the furnace. And the boy said, we don't need to give you an answer in this. Who do you think you are talking to us like that? I'm paraphrasing, but that's literally what they said. King, who do you think you are? The God we serve is bigger than you. And he is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. Here's my favorite part. But even if he doesn't, oh, y'all didn't hear it. King, who do you think you are? Our God's bigger than you. And he can deliver us from your hand and from the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, King, we're still not going to bow down to you and we're still not going to worship your image that you set up. Our God is bigger. Our God is enough. Our God is able to deliver us out of your hand. Our God is able to deliver us from every situation that you can fathom. God is enough. It's one of my favorite per verses in all of the Bible. But if not, O king, <laughs> kill me if you want. I'm not bowing down. Prove God a liar. I'm still going to trust him over you. 
Because God is enough. Second thing is, are you willing to be a totally committed follower? Are you willing to do something extraordinary? Are you willing to, 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 to get out of your comfort zone and not worry about the conditions, not worry about the fine print? Remember, we talked about that. I'm talking about being a totally committed follower. Do you have the courage to stand and say, I am not a fan. I am a totally committed follower. Jesus is my Savior. I will follow him till the day I die. Do you have that courage to stand? If so, stand and sing with us. I'd like to take just an added moment and say thank you for joining us here on the online campus of the South Tacoma Adventist Fellowship. We at staff are thrilled to hear from viewers just like you from all over the world. And we're thrilled to have you join this growing ministry. If you have questions or comments or would like more information about today's topic, I invite you to take just an extra moment to go to our website. It's www.staffonline.org. There you'll find today's presentation as well as previously recorded presentations. You'll also find a contact form that you can use to get in contact with us here at staff. And there's a prayer request page that you can go to if you would like our ministry team to join with you in petitioning the Heavenly Father. That's www.staffonline.org. While you're there, we'd invite you to take a moment to consider partnering with us in this ministry. This ministry is made possible through the generosity of the members of the staff church as well as online viewers like yourself. We believe that Jesus is coming soon and we want to share this gospel with as many people in every way possible that we can before he comes. If you've been blessed today, would you consider being a ministry partner with us in sharing the gospel? You can do that simply by looking for the green link that says give at our website. Finally, I want to say once again, thank you so much for being a part of our time together today. And as we leave you, let me leave you with the words of Paul that he shared to the Thessalonian church. He says this, May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loved us and in his special favor gave us everlasting comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and give you strength in every good thing that you do and that you say, may the Lord's blessings be with you. We'll see you next time.